Good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, for holding on with us and for this far. So um, today, or for my port portion of the presentation, I'm going to be discussing or talking about or touching upon uh, suggested modifications to assistive equipment for mobility and community reintegration for our post-op uh, CP patients or population. Some of the learning objectives that I have here um, and that my hope is to get to is to identify um, some modifications to current seatings that the patients may have, identify alternative equipment during the recovery phase, uh, and discuss positioning options um, and aids post-surgery. So for this presentation, uh, what I've done is I've divided my talk into two groups. Um, my first group is going to be focused on the level GMFCS level ones and twos. Uh, my second portion or my second group is going to be focused on my GMFCS level uh, three and five. So as you already know, and as Dr. Hyman discussed earlier in his presentation, um, the population or our CFS, CMF, uh, CS levels one and twos, uh, they're ambulatory at baseline. Uh, so when I talk about equipment in particular for, for this population, re really I'm talking about is um, equipment, chair equipment uh, and assistive devices that are gonna be um, crucial for them for the recovery aspect of it. It doesn't mean that um, once they go home, they're going to maintain and stay uh, in, in whatever chair they're going home with. So ideally, ide uh, apologies, ideally when the child comes out of surgery in the acute care um, hospital or setting, you have the therapist um, assessing what type of equipment they're going to be going home with. Um, so once they're home and once they're going to their outpatient um, intervention or, or outpatient clinics, what we're looking for once home is really, do we have to make any modifications to the home environment? Um, again, these, this population doesn't necessarily have any equipment and so their home may not be set up uh, for wheelchairs uh, and or for walking devices. So if the patient, for example, if the patient resides upstairs, you may want, you may want to make any modifications to have them stay on the ground floor or on the first level so that there's an easier access um, for when the therapists are coming home to treat um, or there's easy access to get outside, um, taking into account if there's any stairs both indoors and outdoors. With respect to community, um, of course what we want, we want our patients to get up and move and, and, and be out and start to integrate into the community as soon as we can. So we want to take a look. We may need a chair, a seating device that they came home with for going out to simple walks, you want to start to bring them out outside, depending on what the weather is like. Um, you may need a seating system for longer distances. Um, also for your follow-up and uh, for your follow-up appointments with um, the doctors, you may want to consider using a wheelchair, especially if they have any casting or long leg cast or short leg cast um, to really help them uh, for that transition when they're uh, in the waiting room or for those long distances. In addition, you want to be able to, uh, as parents or as your therapist in the home or in outpatient clinics, you want to be um, able to provide the family with some ideas. Look at the car, the transportation. Um, is it suitable for them to be using that, that car? What modifications can you make? Um, and if it's, there's no modifications, then maybe looking into a different uh, way to accessing or getting to the medical appointments. Uh, with, respect, with, sorry, with respect to school, um, really having um, an, a communication with the school uh, administration and therapists, uh, depending on their point of uh, where they are in their recovery, uh, they may no longer be using the chair, they may no longer be using an assistive device, but again, it depends on their recovery, they may be using something. So really having the conversation um, with the school, you may need to do some modifications. Maybe you need an elevator pass or use the elevator, or you may need a little bit more time um, to get from one classroom to the other. So now more specifically, what, am, what are they going to come home with? What am I going to see? What is expected? Um, like I mentioned earlier, once they're in the acute phase, once they go home, you may see for this level, GMFCS level uh, one and two, you may see patients use a reclining chair, a high back reclining chair or, and or a standing chair. 
why would I use one or why would I use recommend one more over the other? It depends on the type of surgery and it depends on um, what casting, if they have any casting or if they have any bracing. So I, ideally, um, we use a re reclining manual chair for positioning and for positioning and comfort. Um, again, this seat to back or the high back allows to recline, to reposition the patient for any um, pain. So a lot of the times if you have any hip surgeries, to be, to be in a static 90 degree angle, um, it's painful. You need position change. We change our sub positions uh, on a daily basis when we sit. So to, to have long leg casts or, or to be in pain and not be able to reposition themselves is really where I'm aiming for here for that comfort. Um, secondly, positioning wise, depending on the type of surgery that you're having or the uh, child had, you may have um, some swelling that you may have to reposition them. But um, if, if anterior muscles or the anterior group muscles are involved, you may not be able to tolerate a 90, uh, 90 degrees seating posture. So you may want to open the seat to back, meaning reclining the back. For if those patients um, positioning, if they have any limitations to the posterior um, hip muscles um, and they're in leg casts, they may be in a position that they're already stretched. So you may want to open the seat to back, again, just to put some comfort and not overstretch um, uh, the posterior aspect or the posterior muscle groups. In addition here, um, I have elevating leg rest. So ideally when you get, uh, or when we're recommending any seating system, we want to consider the use of elevating leg rest. One, if you're in leg, uh, long leg cast or short leg cast or um, ankle uh, casting, you wanna elevate the legs to assist with edema. Uh, you wanna elevate the legs um, in order, again, to assist with positioning. So really having this um, accessory and having that um, with the patients and putting that into mind, it's really to help them also. Why would I choose um, a standard chair versus a reclining chair? It depends on the level of the surgery. So if I have a patient who's having hip surgery, I'm probably gonna go for a reclining chair. If I have a patient who is doing, or who has just a foot reconstruction, then I most likely will be having them sit in a standard chair. Again, um, some of these chairs you can self-propel. Um, it, it really depends on assessing the child and, um, and what, they, what the therapist recommends. Um, moving on to cushion. So sometimes when you're home and, and you want to have them change positions, so they're either going to be in bed, in the chair, on the couch, um, standing, engaged in therapy, or if we, when you're in the community, if there is sitting in these chairs, it, it can create some discomfort. So I always recommend once they're home, evaluate how the child is doing and how they feel. And you might recommend just a, a basic foam cushion um, is, is sometimes just enough to really uh, relieve any pressure. With respect to ambulation devices, again, a lot of these kids, the, idea, the, the goal is to get them up and standing um, on cast, without cast, um, and it really depends on, we want them up and uh, standing as soon as tolerated. Um, we want to provide them with the ability to have an assistive device for stability. Uh, you, you want to be able to have an assistive device um, to provide them with comfort, uh, for stability, and to give them a bit of confidence. So you may want to start off with a. You want to uh, may you may want to start off with a rolling walker, um, or any type of assistive device, or any um, uh, walker that has a little bit more of a wider base. Um, and this is important, again, they're going to transition for this group of patients. They're going to transition out of this um, quicker, and it depends on, on how they're working and it, what devices they have on them. So get a feel for them. Um, if you already know your patient, then you know what they're able to do. If you're new to the case or if you're new therapist to the, um, to, with this patient, this helps you gain that confidence, um, have them gain the confidence with you. Um, as you progress, you may uh, move to loft stand crutches, you may be used to auxiliary crutches um, or, or wide quad cane. Again, it depends on where they, how quickly they move through their um, recovery. 
so now we're going to uh, change gears to our GMFCF levels three and uh, three through five. Again, for this population, um, it's different. Um, the in-home mobility and the community and the school integration is different. These patients already have either a manual chair, they have um, a power chair, they may have an assistive device, um, sorry, a walking uh, device. So really for here, it's going to be important to assess what they already have. So when they come home, you may not have to do any modifications. You're going to probably focus mostly on positioning. Um, in the community, again, looking at what transportation, you may have something already set up. The family may have something already set up for them. So doing any modifications that need to be done, um, educating the families, school, same, um, the same, uh, same concept. Um, they may have something already in place. It's really having that communication. Um, you may have different equipment that you're not going to integrate during their sessions. So having that transition for school. So what kind of equipment are we looking at? So um, as mentioned before, you may have some of these kids who have a tilt and space chair. You may have kids who have powered seating. Um, depending on what surgery uh, the patient has, you may have to make modifications to the actual seating system by now incorporating elevating leg rest. Typically, if you have a tilted space chair and a child already has a tilted space chair, excuse me, a tilted in space chair, you don't necessarily, they don't necessarily have elevating leg rests. Um, typically, they have um, uh, 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 leg rests that are either at 90 or 70 degrees. If we're having any surgery and you, they're going to be in some casting, you want to get an elevating leg rest so that you could um, support their feet adequately. Um, again, if you're having some uh, surgical intervention at the hip and they're in cast or in their embracing uh, an adductor wedge, you may want to consider removing the armrests so that you can have this the seating system, you can have the seating system wide enough now that they have, now that they're in, 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 a, in a casting or if they have a wedge. Um, if they're having any pelvic um, surgery, you might want to consider changing the cushion or if they're sitting, depending on what their posture is, you want to look at their back, what back systems are they using. A lot of the times with these seating systems, you can still open the seat to back angle. So just because it's a, a tilt and space chair, you can make modifications to the back and open it up to allow a better position for comfort, for pain um, and, and change in position. You can change your position with your tilt feature here as well. Um, Getting an elevating leg rest really, um, that takes coordination. If the, the family already has a seating system, it takes coordination with the vendors um, and pre-planning uh, to make sure that this equipment is going to be ready for when the child is post-op. Um, some other ideas and uh, some other suggestions is, you know, if they're in powered seating or you don't have the opportunity to get elevated, elevating leg rest in time is maybe having a backup chair. So depending on what type of surgery and depending um, on the, the age, you may consider a backup chair or you may, the family may already have a backup chair um, and really can, other options that you can have in the interim while modifications are being um, made for whatever seating system they have. Um, with ambulation, it's the same uh, concept. Um, you want to be able to give them the support initially um, for both for both level for all levels. You want to give them the support so that you can see how they're doing with their alignment. Um, you, you're going to work on therapeutic exercises, as Dean had mentioned, when they're walking, giving them a more supportive device. You can focus on alignment um, and making sure that that the motion that they're doing it, it there is that carryover. Um, gait trainers, you may have some uh, um, patients who are already using gait trainers. Um, and once they start moving through their recovery, you, want, you may want to consider either adding a chest prompt. You may want to consider making adjustments to the thigh supports and or to the ankle uh, supports if you, if you need to. Again, this is out of surgery, so you're going to have some of these patients who are weaker. You may need to, be, you may need to go a little bit more supportive, but as they progress and as they recover through your therapeutic interventions, you'll see them move through the equipment. 
some other equipment considerations for um, our GMFC levels uh, three through five. Uh, if the patient has a standard and if they have equipment that prior to surgery they used, uh, we want to get them up in, into that standing position as, uh, as quick as we can. So for here, here I have a couple of standards, but if, they, if the family or if the patient has something like this, this is going to be hard to modify, especially if they're standing um, with their casts on the long leg cast. So you may want to consider um, the possibility of looking into other type of standards. Again, this is depending on where you are. If you're at home, this takes a lot of coordination with your vendor. If you're in a, a rehab facility, these um, other equipment may be available. So you want to make sure that you can use whatever is available um, wherever you are. Um, you may want to move instead of using something like this, you may want to move um, into a different type of standard where it allows a little bit more adjustability to hip abduction, um, especially if you're already using an abductor wedge. Uh, you may want to use these type of standards because it allows for a lot of adjustment to the knee and to the ankle joint. Other options. Um, Again, is a, their, your kid walk. If they're using a kid walk, you may want to do adjustments, give a little bit more support um, when they're walking, um, modify the chest, uh, the chest prompts or any assistance that they need. Other ideas, again, depending on where you are, you have mobile standards, um, and they can there they can allow for some, some of adjustability um, and just make it more independent. So if they can stand, and if they have for your, for example, your GMFCS level three, if they already can self propel a chair, um, but you want to incorporate that standing aspect of it, and they can self propel. This is a great idea. Again, this depends on where you are, of course. Other uh, suggestions are bathing systems and transfers, right? So a lot of the times uh, you will see at home and in parents' home, um, and a lot of the times when I used to provide uh, equipment um, at clinics, you'd see your common bathing, bathing system. Um, and so sometimes this becomes hard, especially post-op. Um, caregivers may be a little hesitant uh, to do transfers because you don't want to hurt them or they're in pain. Um, they may be heavier and there's concerns. So you may want to consider um, other type of seating system or bathing systems. I apologize, bathing systems. This is a HST ba uh, bathing system from Rifton. Um, you may want to consider maybe a temporary uh, loner Hoyer lift or rental of a Hoyer lift in order to help um, transfers for these patients. So here I'm, um, I'm going to talk a lot, a little bit about, a little or a lot about uh, positioning. Um, and positioning not only in the chair, but positioning aids. Um, uh, I, I, for those who do know me, um, I um, have a passion for positioning, posture alignment, and seating, of course, right? So one of the things that um, that I think it's a very important and to keep in mind is that when the children are sleeping, when they're in the beds, um, it's important to look at their alignment in these positions. So sleep is important and, and at baseline and even post-surgery, you want to provide the most optimal position for, for sleep because they need their rest. They need to be able to wake up the next morning and, and be ready for whatever intervention or whatever, whatever they are going to do that day. Um, they're going to be active in, in PT sessions and um, what, whoever the disciplines that are coming or going uh, for outpatients. So you want to make sure that your patients um, have a good night rest. Um, so here, these are just some examples, right? So if you're in bed, um, and of course, the idea is that we get them out of bed as soon as possible. Um, we have wedges, and it depends, it comes in all shapes and sizes, but this particular wedge, it allows you to give uh, a little bit of slack on the posterior muscles, as well as giving some support for elevation for any swelling. In side life, uh, sometimes we see, uh, we have patients and I've seen patients that have the adductor wedge. Um, Sideline in that position may be a little bit difficult. So you may want to include some wedges um, to keep them in good alignment at the hips. In supine, depending if they have some leg, long leg casts, 
you might want to build up some foam. Again, when we're in uh, rest position and if we have cast on, what we tend to do is we tend to go into that external rotation position. Um, it's heavy and you, your, your patients might not have the strength to realign themselves or even to reposition themselves. Um, so really maintaining alignment there for their sake and their comfort um, is something that we need to consider and look at. Uh, Sideline position. We can put them in sideline, and sometimes they, you know, throughout the night, you may they may just move back or fall back into that position. So this is a good option to hold them in that position. This is just a basic foam that I have here. But again, pillows work well also. Um, but keep it in mind, you want to be able to provide the support between the knees, provide that support posteriorly, anteriorly. Um, and again, pillows work great just as well for home if you're home and and they don't need so much uh, they're not going to be in their manual chairs the whole time again great if you have other devices and you want to get them in um put them on the couch um elevate their legs on a stool put some pillows to get some elevation to help with that swelling um and and to help with any positional cha change Some other recommendations, again, um, this is just an example of how important uh, it is to, to be able to position our, uh, our patients in good alignment. Um, you can see here, uh, again, a wedge, uh, side wedges. Um, in the chair, um, the AG ductor wedge, you might wanna consider maybe putting a pillow or holding the legs with the, some TheraBand or um, any other type of banding, to, banding that you may find. Um, here we have just a basic wedge. If they're in bed, it's good to change the position, put them into a semi-reclined uh, semi position. Pool noodles uh, go a long way. Uh, you can use pool noodles, you can cut them up, um, you can go half, um, you can build them, you can put them together and tape them together, put them into a, a sock and use them as a positioning aid for in bed. You could use it for the wheelchairs. Um, you, what I've seen a lot is using these pool noodles um, along the, the riggings or the metal aspects of the chair. So sometimes uh, as, as the kids start to grow and their, their legs or their posture, they may be hitting some of the metal aspect of it. You can put some of these pool noodles to give a little bit of a uh, cushion. Um, here we have uh, something that's called Versiform. Um, so this is basically a pillow. Again, we can use this um, as a different type of equipment for when they're in bed, if you wanna uh, lay them to the side and position the pillow on the posterior aspect or in between their legs or in their chairs. It's really um, a good uh, alternative to providing support. It's really a beanbag. Um, once you position the patient in, in, in your desired uh, position, you extract the air out of the beanbag and it holds. It's meant for stability or to give uh, a little bit more support to whatever posture you have them in. So all this is great, um, and uh, now what? And what are some of the key points? And you know, for for me, it's always it's always hard because there's so much more that I have to say and I want to say. And we have to treat our kids as individual, and every child is different, and every child's recovery is going to be different. But just these are some of my key points. Um, we want to get them standing. We want to get them standing as soon as possible, as soon as the doctors clear them. We want to get them mobile. So really uh, taking it, stepping back and, and taking a, um, a different lens and, and how can I get this? How can I get them mobile? How can I get, make these modifications? Thinking out the box a little bit, um, but always looking at what modifications, what adjustments, what can I do? Um, because of course we want them up standing and we want them moving. For, for so many other reasons, if you're standing for respiratory, for GI, um, which is something that, you know, that always goes along in the benefits of standing. Um, keep access to a vendor. So if the patients already have a vendor, this is a little easier, but for those patients and families who don't have a vendor, um, it, it's really talking to your resources before you leave uh, the hospital. Uh, what can you give me? Who do I talk to? Do I call my insurance company? Are they, they can give, um, a list of uh, durable medical equipment places that you can call and you can ask them. So really having access to a vendor, having that uh, communication with the vendor to either request new or maybe I need to loan something or um, really having that open dialogue. 
alignment. Um, alignment is key. I think that Dean uh, had spoke a lot about the alignment and the purpose of these surgeries is to to do to correct alignment. And so, um, you know, surgery to rehab, um, to doing therapeutic exercises, to positioning at night and and to positioning in the chair or whatever the carryover is going to be with your walkers. Alignment is key. We're we're putting these kids are going and the families are are all making a decision to do this together. And so it's important to always keep that in the back of our heads. Uh, resources. So again, I put out some equipment that may not be available for the home. It might not be available uh, for outpatient clinics, um, and it may or may not be available for any uh, the rehab facilities that you have that the child may go to. But so then, what? What do I do? Um, you know, in New York State, you can go, and I put the resource here. You can go to a triad program and really. What, it, what they do there is that uh, you email them and you provide them if you have with enough time and coordination, you can say, I'm going to have a surgery. This is what I'm looking for. Do you have anything? Um, United Cerebral Palsy Association, you can go onto their website. Uh, you can uh, maneuver and they, sometimes they have some lending closets. Rifton's main page, a lot of these um, manufacturers have resources on their webpage uh, for equipment exchange programs. Um, but again, I'm going to go back and, and say that the vendor and the therapist and your therapist that who you're working with, uh, talk to them because sometimes the vendor may know other people. Uh, the vendors and or therapists may, may have a different um, contact and, and that's how you build that network and that, and that resource aspect of it. And then lastly, um, it's communication. I think that, uh, you know, Dean touched upon it uh, a little bit as well, or I should say a lot of it. And I'll, I'll close uh, with that because um, communication is key. Uh, open dialogue with the team is key for achieving overall goals and rehab uh, progress. And who, who is the communication going to happen? Well, it's the orthopedic team. Um, it's the school. Um, having that transition with school therapists once um, the child is at that point of recovery to go back to school, having a way to uh, maybe we send a packet, maybe send that information, send your, um, your contact information. As mentioned before, the vendor, and most importantly, uh, the patients and the caregivers. So again, this is a team approach and having a, a good handoff to wherever they're going from acute, if they're going home for the home therapist, if they're going to rehab with the rehab therapist, um, overall communication is really an important aspect of um, progress and rehab. Thank you very much.